I'll still talk some more. Hello, welcome to uh, our overview of social sciences research module. My name is Kiana Shiroma. I am the director of the Pre-Health, Pre-Law Advising Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I am also the Re Region 9 Research Committee member. Hello everyone, I'm Megumi Makino Kanehiro and I'm the director of the Manoa Advising Center and Advising Office for Exploratory Students also at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and I am currently serving on the Nakata Board of Directors, the Awards Committee, and the Annual Conference Committee. Hello everybody, my name is Jennifer Brown and I am a transfer specialist and chair of the Manoa Transfer Coordination Center. I'm also a steering committee member for the advising community for transfer students. In this module, we will be covering the foundational knowledge necessary to understand research undertaken from a social science perspective, including the aims of research, epistemology, research methods, validity, and ethics. We also include examples of academic advising research from a social science perspective to provide context throughout this module. At the end is a list of references that were used in the preparation of the module and that are useful for further study. Why do we engage in research? Typically, it's to answer questions or problems in a systematic way. For scholar practitioners, this research is connected to professional practice. As academic advisors engaging in research, we often seek to learn more about advising approaches, specific student populations, and advisor or advisee perspectives, to name a few common areas. Research is needed to advance the field of academic advising, and Nakata's Research Committee and Center for Research support this goal. Nakata's research agenda is focused in three main areas, the impact of academic advising on students and institutions, the context of academic advising, and the theoretical basis of advising practice. All of these areas contribute to both the professionalization and practice of academic advising. Epistemology is the concept of distinguishing between knowledge and opinion or feelings. Essentially, how do we know if something is true? The positivist or empiricist perspective grounds the validity of knowledge in the scientific method of observation, documentation, and testability. The researcher must strive to maintain objectivity and acknowledge their own subjectivity. The underlying assumption here is that there is order and it is possible to know the truth. The hermeneutic or interpretive perspective poses that there is more than an objective knowable truth, but rather that human action has meaning and thus to understand the social world, we must be able to understand the context and the meaning behind behaviors. There are multiple epistemological approaches to research that should be considered in preparing a study. Please see Scott and Usher's Understanding Educational Research linked in our references for additional discussion on epistemology and educational research. Scientific empirical research is grounded in the gathering of data and the building and then testing of theories to explain that data. Social science is the scientific study of human behavior. It essentially applies scientific research con concepts to humanity. Social science disciplines include, but are not limited to, anthropology, economics, education, psychology, sociology, social work, and political science. Each of these disciplines is concerned with human behavior from a particular perspective and can focus on individuals or groups and social context. In social science research, we gather information or data about human behavior and then build and test theories that explain that behavior. And now Kiana's gonna tell us a little bit about methods. Social sciences research includes the use of both qualitative and quantitative research methods. Berg states that qualitative research refers to the meanings, concepts, definitions, characteristics, metaphors, symbols, and descriptions of things. So like in the picture, the questions that come from qualitative methods would be those like, what did you feel when you saw this free ice cream? Excited, a little scared, and why was that? Whereas in contrast, quantitative research refers to counts and measures of things. So for example, only one in 30 took the free ice cream. Interesting. 
So utilization of one or both types of research methods depends on various factors, including the researcher's beliefs, the nature of knowledge and how it can be acquired, the purposes and goals of the research, and the research participants. Qualitative research often focuses on processes and answering questions focusing on what, why, and how. To generate this kind of data, common qualitative methods include interviewing, focus groups, ethnography, sociometry, unobtrusive methods, histography, and case studies. So one example of qualitative research conducted on advising would be my dissertation for which I interviewed 22 high achieving undergraduate students from underserved student populations to better understand their motivational factors. The culturally engaging, engaging campus environments model was a theoretical framework for this study. So all four culturally responsive environmental factors of the CC model emerged as motivational influences. These would include having a collectivistic orientation, a humanized educational environment, a proactive philosophy due to the tracking done by advisors, and receiving holistic support by faculty. So this example demonstrates the rich data that can result from understand or from using qualitative research methods. Quantitative research methods are just as important in social sciences. So with these methods, data can be collected from representative samples of larger populations for certain variables and for specified periods of time. So similar to qualitative methods, Quantitative research also has a variety of data collection methods, such as experiments, surveys, and longitudinal methods. So one such example of quantitative methods employed in research related to advising is a dissertation completed by Dr. Nikki Labarrio Jr. in 2013. So his study examined the impact of students' social and academic backgrounds on baccalaureate degree completion using social stratification theory and focusing mainly on Filipinos as a case study. So this sample consisted of the 1997 Hawaii Department of Education senior class. So this subset or the subset of this cohort that entered the Hawaii public higher education system was around 5,206 students. And they were monitored over a 10 year period from entry following high school graduation to baccalaureate degree attainment. So at the end of this period, 813 students had received undergraduate degrees, including 202 transfer students. So the results of the longitudinal quantitative analyses identified several key events along the pathway that highlight different patterns for retention, persistence, or failure. Entering through the state's community colleges and transferring to university was found to actually decrease the chances of persisting to an undergraduate degree, especially for students pursuing particular types of majors like STEM. Filipino post-secondary students were found to be significantly more likely to enter post-secondary education through the community colleges. So as discussed earlier, both qualitative and quantitative research methods are needed to depict the experiences related to academic advising. It is up to the researcher to determine what specific method is best suited for their particular study. So of course, it must be pointed out that quantitative and qualitative approaches have specific advantages and challenges. Thus, using both together in a mixed method approach may ultimately provide a more comprehensive view. In both quantitative and qualitative studies, it is necessary to prove that findings are valid. However, validity is a complex term dealing with appropriate, meaningful, and useful inferences, terms that are not easily defined and validity focuses on the interpretation of the data, which is itself dependent upon the context of the study. Shu points to other issues of validity, including complexity, recall issues, result interpretations, and suggests that face validity, experts reviewing evidence to assess the usefulness of content and the relationship between items in the assessment instrument, such as factor analysis or the correlation between similar and different traits. But the routes that are used to evaluate validity in quantitative and qualitative studies are slightly different. 
In quantitative studies, validity is based on statistical analysis of data and involves specifying the context under which conditions are seen to be present by examining the content, such as area to be uh, studied, advising, criterion, factor to be studied, such as graduation rates, and construct, attribute, or trait, such as self-efficacy. Different types of analysis may be used depending upon what theories are being tested. Quantitative studies are often anecdotally referred to as number crunching because typically large pools of data are analyzed based on the quantitative instrument via computer software packages and the statistical significance of various correlation and regression models are examined. Instruments can be developed by the researcher or published psychometrically tested instruments can be employed. Reliability is also a key concern for quantitative researchers. Reliability asks the classic question, how reliable are your findings based on freedom from error? As Pettiger and Schmelkin point out, reliability is a necessary but not a sufficient criterion for validity. The Labario study, for example, is a longitudinal study of two sources of data and utilized a logical regression model. Qualitative studies utilize open-ended questionnaires, focus groups, interviews, field observations, and review of documents. Types of studies can include narrative studies, phenomenological studies, grounded theory studies, ethnographic studies, and case studies. Thus, interpretation and coding of data becomes the key vehicle for analyzing data. All interpretations must be supported by data, and the element of interpretation requires that different issues be addressed. Rather than validity and reliability, qualitative researchers are concerned with trustworthiness and goodness of the research. To this end, researchers consciously employ a number of vital techniques, such as gathering data and writing up that data in a way that allows others to understand the context of the study, audit trails, maintaining in meticulous detail how data was collected and decisions were made, use of rich, thick descriptions, providing specifics about the context of the study that will allow others to assess how transferable findings may be. Also focus on perspectives being used through triangulation, deliberately using varied ways to collect data, pulling from multiple data sources and employing multiple people in the research, and positionality, acknowledging the role of the researcher and its impact on the study. Once Initial interpretations have been reached, bringing in expert opinions to review and bear on findings, member checks, which means double checking with the study participants, and peer debriefing, having an external re researcher review interpretations. Ethical considerations are always of paramount importance in all research studies. Kitchener, as summarized in Shu, laid out ethical considerations that include respecting autonomy of subjects, doing no harm, benefiting others, being just, being faithful, securing informed consent, following regulations, and securing approval in, of institutional review boards. Also, data access, data ownership, credit, crediting contributors, and additional legal situations may arise. That's a lot. Cresswell emphasizes that ethical considerations must be addressed in every stage of a study, and his text contains a complete table of ethical considerations in qualitative research and ways of addressing each one, if you want to take a look at that. Lisa provides additional considerations that have been advanced by indigenous researchers, accountable responsibility, respect, reciprocity, and rights and regulations of the research. In addition, committed researchers define their responsibilities and are consistently engaged in self-reflection and self-questioning that promotes and privileges the right of the disempowered to be heard as evidenced through language interna interna internationalization <laughs> forgive me, of indigenous experiences, history, and critique. For a historical perspective on the development of trustworthiness and ethics in collaboration and the proliferation of models designed to address these areas, please see Marshall and Rossman. As an example, in my study, one of my ethical considerations was to not have undue influence on my interviewees. Thus, I only interviewed students who were no longer my advisees. 
In addition, as on being a scholar practitioner written by myself and my colleagues, Dr. Michael Kirk Kuai and Dr. Nikki Labarios explain, scholarship may, it is not an activity that a select few should do, but a necessary part of advising. Research is a form of assessment, a feedback loop that allows us to constantly improve what we do for the students at our institution, for us personally, and the advising profession as a whole. So for example, I use the results from my study to inform how my program should best allocate our time and resources to support our students and focus on individualized advising as opposed to larger group advising. As data-driven decision-making becomes the way in which institutions make decisions regarding funding and programming, research becomes a necessary tool to assist this process. It can also help advisors to improve their practice by requiring constant reflection upon their work. And finally, it promotes and highlights the important work that advisors do and makes it accessible and understandable to the outside world. Nakata offers a wide variety of resources that can assist you in your efforts in pursuing research and scholarship. First and foremost, the Nakata Research Center and Research Committee provide a wealth of resources. In addition, it is possible to sign up for writing groups. At recent Nakata annual conferences, research consultations with Nakata members who have experience, expertise in research were also available. The Nakata Research Symposium provides professional development in this area. The Nakata Research Grant provides funding for research in the field of advising. A number of scholarship opportunities are available for graduate students. Advisors enrolled in graduate programs can apply for the annual conference scholarship, the Nakata Scholarship, and the Research Advising Seminar Scholarship. There is also a student research award that supports students who are working on a master's or PhD program and research in the, way, in the field of advising for up to a year after completion. We hope you found this research module helpful. Please take a look at the resources on the Nakata website for further information. Thank you.